In tonight's Dorchester segment, we'll hear more about cutbacks at UMass Boston, reading the numbers on violent crime, and how an old strategy for reducing blight can be affected by a hot real estate market. And to fill us in is the news editor for the Dorchester Reporter, Jennifer Smith. Uh, thank you very much for being with us again, Jennifer. Of course, Chris. I want to start you off on uh, the city budget. We know how the city wants to spend on some things, maybe in Dorchester, and I guess the overall trends here. So what's going on with that? Yeah, so the city budget this year that Mayor Walsh has proposed, it obviously needs to go through the city council for refining and approval, but he's proposing a $3.29 billion budget. It's up quite a bit from last year. And one of the trends that we see again is that most of the revenue the city's bringing in is from property taxes. Those are accounting for 70% of all of the revenue going into the budget this year. Uh, and that's up about 0.7% from last year, but it still remains the biggest chunk of, of our revenue. And over year, year over year, experts say, be careful about how much of our revenue is coming from property taxes. The tax burden is already pretty high. But we are seeing some good investments in local areas. Uh, some of the biggest expenditures in Dorchester, for instance, are in libraries, where there's going to be about an $18 million renovation of the Adams branch, uh, Adams Corner branch of the Boston Public Library, which could use for, with some res uh, which could use some renovations, and then also a brand new library in Upham's Corner, uh, which is part of this broader redevelopment that's happening in Upham's Corner alongside the Strand Theater. And then the last one is they're putting about $12 million into investigating where we might see a Fields Corner library branch. So on top of investments in a new fire station and improvements in parks, the libraries really seem to be a focus when we're thinking about Dorchester. Well, the city's doing more spending because it has a more robust property tax base, but, but what about state funding for the city? How's that look? Yeah, state funding continues to be a bit of a sticking point. Obviously, the charter reimbursements are tremendous. Walsh keeps, uh, Mayor Walsh keeps cautioning people. When you think about the budget that we're looking at right now, you've got to account for about $40 million that just in some way or another has to go back to reimbursing the state in large part for charter schools. So there's, there's this continuing frustration about what the city could be redirecting that funding toward if the state would just meet its reimbursement levels. You've also recently written about crime statistics and there seems to be some sort of a disconnect between um, the, the areas where most of the homicides take place and the reputations of whole neighborhoods, whether it's Roxbury, Mattapan, or Dorchester. What did you read into that? Yeah, so we had, we had an interesting time pulling crime stats on the neighborhood level. So uh, the way that Boston generally measures crime statistics is by these police districts. And Dorchester, since it's gigantic, actually overlaps into a bunch of different police districts, all of which saw a pretty substantial decline in overall serious crimes year over year over year with a pretty moderate trend. Uh, and the problem is that these are also some of the same neighborhoods where you do see homicides disproportionately clustered. But talking to the former C-11 captain, Tim Connolly, he emphasizes, of course, this isn't just a matter of if you enter a neighborhood, you're going to get shot regardless of what kind of historic and not really totally deserved reputation areas like Dorchester and Mattapan have. It's that there are certain, uh, whether it's gang-related or targeted or retributive shootings, um, that's about 95% of these, of these homicides that are happening. And overall, you are seeing a decline in crime. It does kind of fly in the face in some ways with reputations that neighborhoods like Mattapan, which uh, the police captain down in B3 in Mattapan notes is still sometimes called by a kind of pretty pejorative name, Murder Pan. Um, and in fact, B3 has seen some of the highest percentage decreases in crime this year. They've only had one homicide so far. And since last year, compared to this section of last year, they're down about 25% in crime, the single largest decrease in overall crime across the city. And of course, if you live in one of these uh, neighborhoods in the city, uh, you can be in one section of Mattapan and feel totally worlds removed from mm -hmm. some of those horror stories. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so City Councilor Andrea Campbell points out that in a lot of ways uh, they're trying to counter the narrative by pointing out, look, we're seeing these improvements in overall statistics. We're seeing new investments, new developments like the Mattapan Square Station. We're seeing the Ponset Greenways go in uh, and same across Dorchester, which is there's a real push to 
kind of improve the quality of life for those in the neighborhood with the understanding that there's an intersection between re resources and amenities and kids often feeling like they have no other option but to pursue illegal activities. You also uh, uh, wrote about a very interesting phenomenon that I remembered from the bad old days in mm -hmm. Dorchester when you had lots of housing abandonment, houses you know, burning down to the yeah. ground, and then the, the remaining property turned into a dump. Yeah. Uh, so the city tried to get rid of that by encouraging the neighbors to buy that piece of mm -hmm. land, clean it up, you know, maybe park a car on it, and, and um, what's happening to those pieces of land right now? Yeah, so there was, in, starting in the 90s, going through early 2000, about 400 lots were actually sold off by the city in an attempt to, as, as you put it, turn these into open space, parking, maybe the spot for a little shed or something. And there's been this odd resurgence that neighbors have noticed in Dorchester where these little side yards, maybe, you know, 3,000 square feet or less. So now we'd view it as maybe the size of a one family home if you're lucky and kind of squeezing it in there. But these lots were given over to their neighboring, uh, the neighboring properties with the intention of being open space, not really supposed to be used for anything aside from maybe an addition, like a living room or a shed or something. And they're not supposed to be used as hazardous dumping grounds, which I'm sure you remember from, from photographing them. But there's this weird loophole in there where you're allowed to build an addition. So over on Westville Street, a few of the neighbors noticed that there was a pretty modest three-decker that just became almost double the size and turned to three luxury condominiums that don't really look like anything else on the street. And they didn't need to be notified. The owners didn't have to go to the zoning board because of that weird loophole saying, if it's an addition, you can build it, even if it's this tiny parcel of land. So I was talking to the city's housing chief, Sheila Dillon, this week about how the city kind of approaches buildable and unbuildable lots now. And she pointed out there is no way the city would do the same thing now. Land is just too scarce to go giving away 3,000 square feet in the middle of a neighborhood. Some of these uh, vacant lots, you know, they used to have houses on them, so mm -hmm. it only makes sense in a way to have houses on them again. But on the other hand, if, if people bought these for a song 30 years ago... $750 uh, this, this, in yeah. the case of, of uh, two, uh, 212 Westville, $750. Yeah. Can you imagine that now? The city should have a piece of that, shouldn't it? Yeah, well, so that's, the, that's kind of the discussion there is they're not saying don't build there at all. They're basically saying that there should be a normal process to it is if you've got land that could be built on that maybe once had a house on it maybe you should let the neighbors know and maybe it should go through the normal the normal zoning process to do it because we're in a land crunch well there's another uh, controversial uh, acquisition that's making news in dorchester even though it's not really happening in dorchester mm -hmm. and that's i guess uh, the latest umass acquisition uh, mount ida college and, and here it is over at umass uh, at boston Amherst, the harvard yeah. campus oh, totally yes. different story yes exactly so the the basic story of it is mount ida and newton was planning on on closing and UMass Amherst independently coordinated with Mount Ida to buy that campus kind of as a near Boston satellite for its Amherst campus. And the reason there's been such an outcry around UMass Boston on Columbia Point is they're saying, hey, this is a public university system and you already have a university in Boston that's really been strained with a lot of its resources lately. It's had systemic budget problems, crumbling infrastructure, chaos around leadership where uh, they're searching for a new permanent chancellor right now. And there's been a lot of pushback from the student body, uh, from the deans uh, of many of the colleges who submitted a letter to, uh, to UMass uh, leadership saying, we're worried that this indicates something about how you're prioritizing this campus, which they feel has the potential to be a real flagship for the UMass Boston system. And just before we came over here, actually, uh, Marty Meehan, president of UMass, released a statement basically defending the decision, saying this is UMass Amherst acting independently. Uh, it's not UMass Boston redistributing fund, or it's not uh, the University of Massachusetts redistributing funds that would be going to UMass Boston, for instance, but rather Amherst 
reaching out to take on that campus. And they did point, really interestingly, to the Bayside lot, which we've talked about before, uh, right on the UMass Boston campus as the potential to generate new revenue, millions and millions of dollars in new revenue for that campus, basically trying to make the argument that the Mount Ida acquisition isn't connected at all to UMass Boston, which those at UMass Boston are finding a little bit difficult to swallow. Uh, finally, I want to ask you about one candidate update for one race, and this is for <laughs> Suffolk County District Attorney. There are four yes. people we've heard about before, but uh, there's more recently a fifth candidate. Five now. We're at six, actually. Six. Give it me. just keeps growing, the, the field. Yeah, we have the five Democrats. So we've got Evandro Carvalho, um, Rachel Rollins, Shannon McAuliffe, Greg Henning, and Linda Champion, who all took place in a forum the other day. At, uh, that hosted by the JP Progressives and the NAACP branch in Boston. But now we have our first Republican in the race, which is a Michael Maloney, who's a Brockton lawyer, uh, specializing in criminal defense and cannabis law. So that's an interesting addition to that race. And uh, finally, uh, Jennifer, if uh, people want some more information as it breaks, you've got the Dorchester Reporter in your mm -hmm. own Twitter feed. Yes, so we're all at uh, dot news dot com, and you can follow us on Twitter at the paper, at dot news, or me, at Jen dot Smith. Thank you very much for being with us. Of course. Jennifer Smith from Dorchester Reporter.